Uh, Emily, thank you so much for being our speaker today. I am so excited. Like, I love your work and it's been <laughs> so exciting for me to like randomly stumble into it in like Twitter and the Artemis podcast of all things. And, like, right. <laughs> it's fantastic. I'm just like, oh, it's so wonderful to hear this amazing work that is sort of outside what people think is the, you know, the standard norm for, um, for fire research, I guess. So. Yeah, it's definitely uh, interdisciplinary for sure. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, do you want me to go ahead and share my screen or not yet? Uh, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, actually, let's go have you go ahead and share your screen. Um, it says it is disabled. Oh, so Franz has to make you the host because I think I actually don't have that capacity. Yeah, so. Aha, I am host now. I'm the host. Okay, folks, if you are joining, we'll get going in just a minute here. Um, you know, it wouldn't be a California fire science seminar if we didn't have technical difficulties. Uh, so in a sec, we'll go ahead and get started here in just a second um, as we are waiting for attendees to join. Looks like we have relatively stabilized a few more folks joining in. Uh, while we've got the last folks trickling in, this is a, um, a spring break week for a lot of universities. So uh, we'll see what the, what the attendee level looks like. But uh, while folks are joining, if you have not joined us before, uh, this is the California Fire Science Seminar Series, uh, which is uh, hosted by the University of California Berkeley Fire Research Group um, and is organized and hosted by myself. I'm Crystal Colden at the University of California Merced. Uh, and my co-hosts and organizers are Dr. Jeanette Copiamenikas, uh, also at the University of California Merced, and Dr. Michael Gallner at the University of California, Berkeley. And we uh, have joined together with the uh, California Fire Science Consortium uh, to host this series uh, on a broad range of fire topics uh, relevant to and in the state of California. Uh, some quick housekeeping items. Uh, if you have not joined us before, or just a reminder if you have, uh, this is a webinar, so the uh, the ability for participants to uh, speak or turn in their video is disabled. If you have a question, we ask that you please use the Q&A tool that is a function of the Zoom webinar uh, on the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. One of the things that you should be able to see is uh, a little icon uh, with Q&A. So if you have questions for our speaker, please put them in the Q&A uh, and we will get to those questions uh, when she's done with her presentation. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we will have, so few, so, so, uh, have some time for a few questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, and then, as per usual, we have our second hour from four to five is a uh, webinar interactive discussion with our speaker. Um, I should not say webinar because it's not a webinar. It's an interactive Zoom discussion. Um, and that is actually at a different Zoom link so that it is uh, enabled for discussion. Uh, and we will post the link for that discussion in the chat box um, as we move towards the conclusion of this seminar. OK, so I have babbled on long enough. Let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today. I am very excited about this um, because beavers are amazing engineers. Um, and when I first learned that they could also be uh, fire engineers, I was so excited to learn more. Um, Dr. Emily Fairfax is uh, an assistant professor in environmental science and resource management uh, she's at the California State University Channel Islands, uh, and she has degrees in chemistry and physics from Carleton College, uh, and then a PhD in uh, geological sciences from UC Boulder. Uh, she uses remote sensing and field work to understand how beaver activity can create drought and fire resistant patches in the landscape under a changing climate. Uh, these fire refugia are so cool, and I'm really excited to, to see more of these in her pictures today. 
today. Um, and <laughs> she, uh, if you if you don't follow Dr. Fairfax on, on Twitter, I highly recommend you following her on Twitter because I have never seen so much information about beavers nor so many jokes about beavers uh, from anyone else on Twitter. So I am very happy to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Emily Fairfax. Thank you. I am super excited to be here today. Super happy to be talking about beavers and fire to such a cool crew. So the title of my talk today, Smokey the Beaver, Can Beavers Keep Riparian Zones Green During Wildfire? I'm going to answer that question for you today. And perhaps this picture on the first slide is a bit of a spoiler, um, but I'm really looking forward to starting from square one all the way up to the end state, the burned state, and seeing the role that beavers play when you have something like a wildfire coming through your landscape. So. Climate is changing, right? We all know that. I feel like that's not something I need to spend a lot of time talking about here. Uh, and wildfires are pretty out of control. And when I say they're out of control, I mean that they're very much out of our control. And we as people have tried for a very long time to make sure that wildfires are something we could control, that we could keep in check. Uh, but suddenly we're finding that we can't. I mean, had anybody seriously had the word gigafire and megafire in their everyday vocabulary until these past couple of years? Uh, no, but now I'm hearing it all the time. And now it's just like, oh yeah, another mega fire hit California. And that is very, very different than things used to be. And so a lot of people are asking themselves, what can we do about it, right? What can we do about this? Climate change is clearly fueling these just incredible wildfires. What can we do about it? We want to do something. There's sort of two avenues of dealing with anything in climate change. We've got climate mitigation, which is the long-term reductions in emissions. We're trying to slow or stop climate change. We're trying to slow that warming down, make it so that all of these disasters that seem to be getting worse and more frequent uh, don't happen like that anymore. However, climate mitigation isn't necessarily going to fix the consequences of climate change that has already occurred. So we're already dealing with the consequences of climate change. It's not some future thing to think about. It's happening right now in the form of droughts and floods and fires. And then there's climate adaptation. So climate adaptation is more along the lines of long and short term actions that we can take today to minimize the damage from climate change that has already occurred. So climate has already changed. What can we do to protect our own lives and protect our infrastructure now? Now, climate adaptation isn't necessarily going to slow or stop the trajectory of climate change. It is somewhat like putting a, a patch on a leak and hoping that it's okay for now, um, but it's important, right? We're being affected by climate change right now. We need to deal with it right now. And to do that, we need engineers. There's no way around that. Climate change has brought on an unprecedented demand for engineering creativity. Uh, in all sorts of different sectors. We have engineers dealing with massive rock slides and landslides and our cliffs collapsing from the ocean waves, smacking up against them at a rate and with a force that we are not familiar with. We are having floods go out over the levees, break the levees, fill the landscape with water in places that have too much water. And then in other places, like out here in California, we're watching and waiting our, and seeing if our reservoirs can fill up. We want to have more water. We don't have enough water. And this is common throughout the West. And in Oregon, uh, there's this headline that I saw. And it, at first, I was like, wow, uh, Oregon lawmakers reluctantly make a $17 million down payment on wildfire preparedness. And I was like, man, that is a lot of money, right? Engineers are really expensive. This is not a cheap fix. Where is the money for this coming from? Uh, and then I looked up Cal Fire's budget, and my mind was absolutely blown. Uh, so the 2021 budget, which was a decrease as far as I know uh, from previous years, was $2.5 billion, of which $2.1 billion is for wildfire response. So clearly climate change is coming with a really, really high price tag. And we need engineers, we need to adapt. It's not a question of like, should we? Like, well, obviously we, we need to. Uh, it's our lives and our infrastructure on the line here, but it's really expensive and that's a problem, but we need engineers. So how can we reconcile this? Well, I would suggest taking a step back and looking at nature's engineers. We're not the only engineers on this planet. Uh, there's another engineer out there that's a little bit furrier, a little bit harder working in my opinion, that has been working on the landscape for millions of years and it does so for free. And so when I think about climate change and climate adaptation, I do think we need engineering to outsmart it and to protect ourselves, but I don't think that engineering needs to come from people. So climate is changing, wildfires are out of our control, but maybe we should be asking instead, what can beavers do about it? 
beavers dampen flood waves. And if you're sitting there thinking like, hold up, I thought we were talking about fires. We are now talking about floods. This feels like it's the exact opposite. Um, it is, but it's all part of the same story. And that's the story that I'm going to tell you today, which is the role of beavers in this climate change, in this warming world, and how it ultimately uh, ends up with the beavers fighting our wildfires. So to starting at square run, we do have beavers dampening flood waves. This is established research. This has been known for decades that when you have a bunch of beaver dams in a watershed and you got your snowmelt peak screaming down or you got some big rainfall event, when that flood wave gets into these beaver wetlands, it is dampened. It is lessened in intensity. Uh, and this happens around the world. It happens in the UK where they have uh, the Eurasian beaver. It happens in North America where we have the North American beaver. And it kind of makes sense when you think about it, just visually, uh, we're looking now from above onto a stream without beavers. And you've got your stream corridor cruising through the middle here, got some riparian vegetation on either side. Uh, it's a pretty simple stream, single thread, not particularly interesting, but this is what a lot of our streams look like in the American West. They aren't particularly interesting anymore. A lot of them are incised or have pretty narrow riparian zones. That is, unless we have beavers. If we have beavers, the story's totally different. You get into this beaver dam section of the stream, and first of all, you have this huge dam that can span, I mean, I've seen them as small as maybe six feet across, six feet long, uh, up to like 300 feet long, 500 feet long. These can be really, really long structures. They're not particularly tall. On average, a beaver dam is maybe half a meter to a meter tall. Uh, the tallest one I have personally seen is just over nine feet tall, and it was definitely an anomaly. Um, but most of them are at the height of my knees or maybe slightly above. Even if it's a relatively short flow obstruction, these beaver dams do create pretty large wetland areas behind them. And then the beavers, well, when they're on land, uh, if you haven't seen a beaver in person, they are uh, round and not particularly skilled at on-ground uh, locomotion. So a beaver is a very fatty animal. It's a lot like a seal. And it's got this nice thick insulation layer that's really important for its life cycle and everything like that. But when you put it on land, it is not good at running. It is super awkward. It is easy pickings for any predator that's interested in it. But as soon as it's in the water, totally different story. Beavers in the water are so agile. They can hold their breath 15 minutes. They can swim super fast and super acrobatically and escape almost any predator. And because of that, beavers are well aware of this. Evolution has taught them that. Uh, they know they need water to survive. So they dig these channels out into the landscape, radiating outwards from their main ponds. And those channels route water out all the way through the riparian zone, further into the floodplain, so that beavers themselves can move around more swiftly, but also so that they can float back trees and sticks and logs that they use in their building and also for their food. So beavers are doing all of this construction with the self-interest of having a pond to live in, but the consequences of that are huge. So when you have a flood wave coming down the river, whether that is from snowmelt happening or from a big storm, or maybe there was a dam breach from like a real human dam upstream somewhere, that flood wave, when it's confined to a single channel, a single simple channel, is not going to be uh, necessarily a good thing for the stream channel. It's going to come through and it's going to do damage. This is a lot of power in this flood wave being confined to a really narrow channel, often without access to the floodplain, which makes it really destructive. But as soon as you get into that beaver dammed area, as soon as you enter the beaver pond, the flood wave is now hitting deeper water and it is also hitting a wider area of water. And so it can start to spread out. It can be radiated out to the floodplain via these beaver channels. And yeah, sure, there might be a little bit of damage done, a little bit of scouring. It was a flood wave after all. But it has so much more area to spread out over. <clears throat> and the water is so much deeper that it really does slow it down. And it attenuates this flood wave. And it takes time for this to happen. And so ultimately, when your flood wave does go back downstream, it's less powerful, it's less intense, and it's more smeared out. And the beaver pond has diffused this flood wave. And so while you had erosion and soil loss and scouring in your stream that does not have any beaver activity, when you have the beavers, the water has been spread out, it has been slowed down, and actually a good amount of it has been stored in the beaver pond and in the surrounding soils. So if you're thinking right now, hold up, are these beaver dams and ponds stopping all the water? Are they starving that downstream area of water? That's not good, right? You can talk to any land manager out there. Nobody wants to hear that their upstream neighbor is taking all the water. You want your water to come downstream too. And that's a fair question. 
I want to just point out how much of North America is snowmelt dominated, uh, especially in the American West and in California. And so what I've got on the left here is a figure uh, from a Nature article that talks about how much of our runoff is coming from snowmelt. And you can see throughout the American West that we've got these dark blue colors indicating a very large percentage of our snowmelt or of our runoff is snowmelt. Now, if you're looking over here in California and you're like, hey, we're coastal, right? We don't, we're not that dependent on snowmelt. We've got our coastal rains and our winter rains and it's all good. Uh, I would encourage you to look at this other figure, which is showing us the share of irrigation demand met by snowmelt. So even if we're not necessarily getting all of our runoff from snowmelt, we are using snowmelt aggressively in our irrigation practices. We're a massive, massive agricultural producer as a state and that water largely is coming from snowmelt. So beaver ponds, what they're doing is they're slowing but not stopping the water. So I'm gonna show you a graph now and on our Y axis, we have stream flow in volume per time. So this is basically just how much water is coming through the stream at any given time. And then on our X axis, we have time. I've labeled some kind of key time periods on here for you to think about. So in the winter, December through April, if we're being generous, we've got snowpack accumulating, we've got rain falling, the reservoirs are filling. This is a time when water is increasing in the landscape. And then May, all the way through about September, that's our peak plant water demands. That's when the plants have lots and lots of sunlight and they're all trying to grow at max capacity if they have enough water to do so. And now historically, I would say that peak fire danger was typically in this August through November timeframe, although I'm getting more and more cautious with saying we have a fire season because it kind of feels like we don't anymore. It's just fire year round. But this is when uh, typically there's less water coming through the landscape and the plants are starting to dry out and senesce and an, an ignition event would be particularly dangerous. Now with these times of the year in mind, this is what an undammed stream in a snowmelt dominated system would look like. So what we have is not a lot of flow during the winter. Stuff is accumulating as snowpack or you know we're getting some drizzling but it's up in the reservoirs, it's not coming down yet. And then as we go into the snowmelt season, we get a big tall peak. And that is so characteristic, like go out to Colorado, go to the Sierras, as soon as snowmelt happens, the streams are rushing with water. Uh, it's a beautiful sight. And that somewhat overlaps with when the plants are wanting water. So the plants are wanting water when they have lots of sunlight, um, they're trying to grow, they're trying to do their photosynthesis. And that's all great until we get into this latter half of the summer. So in the latter half of the summer, snowmelt has largely flowed away. We're not seeing those really high rushing waters anymore in July and August and September, especially not in October and November. And yet we have a bunch of plants that either just finished growing or are still trying to grow, but suddenly there's not a lot of water for them. Compare this to a beaver dam stream. So when you have got beavers, remember they're slowing that water down. Every time that flood wave hits them, they can spread it out into the landscape with their channels. They can store it in the soil. They can store it in the ponds. And so what we get is just a more smeared out uh, picture of stream flow. So you've got the beaver dam and it's slowing down that water. We got snow melt starting to happen and the beavers are actively doing that flood wave dampening. And then whereas the snow melt peak would have left already by June or July in this beaver dam stream, you're still squeaking out the snow melt flows all the way into September, October, and even a little bit into uh, November. The total water volume, which is mathematically the area under these curves, is approximately the same. There is a little bit less water in the beaver dam stream that comes down, and that's because it's being lost in huge air quotes to groundwater recharge and plant evapotranspiration. And I have a word about those losses in just a second. Um, but what it feels like for people is it does feel like the beavers have taken all the water. And I can totally acknowledge that. If you are in a snowmelt dominated system and you're used to seeing this super big flow, uh, in the late spring, early summer, and suddenly that flow is not there. There's a huge reduction in flow during the snowmelt peak. That's alarming. You're like, oh my gosh, there's no water this year. We have no water. Uh, this is going to be a terrible year. But what you don't necessarily pick up on as much is the relatively smaller differences into the late summer and into the fall of your increased base flow in the beaver dam stream. So you notice that flow that's missing. You notice not having this big dramatic rushing water in your streams, but it's harder to notice the fact that in August, your stream is just maybe a couple inches deeper than it would have been otherwise. And that's what the beavers are doing for us. So what about those water losses to groundwater and plants? Isn't losing water a bad thing? 
to be perfectly honest, I wish that uh, we could lose more water to groundwater and plants. We seriously need to recharge our groundwater. And by giving the plants that water, what you're doing is allowing the beavers to keep these plants green during droughts. So this stored water that the plants access and that they're using during the late summer, it's available for them during drought, whether that drought is a seasonal drought, so where it gets hot and dry every single summer and they don't have enough water typically, or in a multi-year drought. And this is also science that has been known for a while now. Over 10 years of research on this topic has shown again and again that the activity of beavers in a waterway does contribute to keeping those plants in that waterway green, even during droughts. So let's start off with the conceptual model. If we got that stream without beavers, now I want you to think about it, we're looking down into the soil now instead of from above. We've got a bunch of plants over here. This is our little single thread stream. We've got some water coming into the soil from above, deep groundwater, really typical in the American West. And then the stream is sort of routing some water into groundwater. Now this, the shape of this actual curve in here could totally vary based on a hundred different things. But in general, like the stream does contribute some water into the groundwater system. Now, if we have beavers on that stream, uh, it looks very different. We've got a really huge pond in the middle instead of this little narrow channel. And then each of these little things that you're looking at throughout the floodplain, these are those channels that beavers are digging throughout the landscape. And so with our deep water table and our infiltrating precipitation, it doesn't actually matter for the plants if we're in a stream without beavers or with beavers, right? As long as we've got that infiltrating precipitation, all the plants are watered. It's like you got a watering can and you're walking around over all the plants in the landscape and they're all happy. Who cares what's in the groundwater if it's raining? Well, <laughs> it matters when it stops raining. So as soon as you take away that rain, as soon as you enter drought conditions, those plants, when they're cut off from all of the rainfall and all of the precipitation from above, they need to have water in the soil. They need to have groundwater they can access. And if they're really close to the stream and that stream is still flowing, maybe they'll be able to stay green. Uh, but if they're out of the range of that stream impact on groundwater or the beaver impact on groundwater, those plants are gonna wither. And that's exactly what I think is happening at landscape scale across the American West. When you have these streams that are you know, getting really weak in the summertime and the precipitation is cut off. I mean, there's places that I do field work where it doesn't rain for like five months straight. And you can see all these plants are just going crispy, crunchy and golden and like they are not thriving. Um, but by these beaver ponds, because these beavers have stored so much water in the soil and they've been sort of banking away all of this water during the rainy period, and protecting it from being lost downstream or being lost to soil evaporation. When you do have a dry period, those plant roots, they can still access soil water and they can access it until this entire system has dried out. And so the whole riparian zone around beaver ponds is like a sponge. And that sponge fills up when it's rainy or when you got snowmelt coming through or when there's any kind of a, a flood event that the beaver pond can route that water out into the floodplain. And then when you've got dry times, that sponge can slowly be wrung out by all the plants in the landscape as they access that water to continue doing their photosynthesis with the abundant sunshine of the California summer. So that's a great conceptual model. And I wish that I could just like say, I think this happens and have it count as science. Um, but in fact, you actually have to do some science and collect some data to prove it. And so what I'm gonna show you is the science and the data that I have collected proving that beavers can in fact buffer droughts. So what I do is primarily remote sensing. I love going in the field and I love field work, but uh, I don't really like taking data in the field that much because it feels very difficult sometimes. Uh, beaver ponds are mucky, they're very sensitive, they're beautiful, um, but they're not somewhere that I really wanna be going out and trying to take 100,000 measurements. So instead of doing it in the field, I like to do it with satellites. So the first thing I do is I go in Google Earth or whatever available aerial imagery I have, and I find the location and I measure the lengths of all the beaver dams in the landscape. And then I use satellite data. And for the drought buffering study, I used Landsat 8 satellites with a model called Metric, which let me estimate the evapotranspiration of all the riparian vegetation in a landscape. And then I use Landsat 8 again to get the NDVI, which is the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or the plant greenness, of all of the riparian vegetation as well. And when I put all this kind of data together, what I can do in any given landscape is compare the vegetation health in dammed versus undammed sections throughout my study area. So I can sort of take apart 
the landscape and bin it into sections with beavers and sections without beavers and see how those sections fare during droughts. And so the study that I did this on in particular was uh, a couple of watersheds up near Elko, Nevada uh, that contain Susie and Maggie Creeks. Now these creeks are somewhat famous restoration examples at this point. The history behind these creeks is that they were heavily, heavily incised, very overgrazed, not doing so hot. And then the ranchers on those creeks decided, hey, you know what, let's try to get these into a healthier shape. The cows don't have any grass, there's no water flowing, it's not good. So they started a restoration effort, I want to say in like 1999 or 2000. And then by I think 2003, they had beavers show up. And they weren't really sure why the beavers showed up. They were not introduced as far as I know. The nearest beaver colony I could find was like 50 kilometers away. But as soon as the restoration got to the point where there were willows, a beaver's favorite food, along the creek, all these beavers showed up and they dammed the crap out of these streams. Like there are now, I think 300 dams on one of these streams and 200 dams on the other, like exceptionally heavily dammed streams. It's incredible. And so on Maggie Creek here, we have a very heavily dammed section of the creek on this top portion, lots and lots of beavers in there. And then a topographically and hydrologically pretty similar section of creek down here, except there's no beavers. Now what I'm gonna show you is the ET, the evapotranspiration and the NDVI of these two areas. And red in both of the instances of ET and NDVI, that indicates that the plants are not doing very good. Uh, whereas blue indicates they are, they're either cycling a lot of water by doing a lot of photosynthesis or they are just very green. Uh, they have a high NDVI. So in our evapotranspiration signal in that data, what we can see is that there is a very, very bright blue signal up in this section that is heavily damped. Lots and lots of beavers up here. And this is July of 2014. So this is the summertime, and this was also in the middle of an extended three-year drought. Down in the section without any beavers, it does not look like it's doing as, as well. It looks pretty, uh, pretty dried up, pretty crinkly, not so hot. Now, a very, very reasonable thing for you to be thinking right now is, okay, well, you showed me those pictures of the beaver ponds, and they have a huge open water area. Of course, evapotranspiration is going to be high. It's just a lot of open water evaporation. It's not plants. It's just that these are wasting water, sending it to the atmosphere, right? Wrong. Look at this NDVI. So this is the plant greenness. And what you can see in this landscape is really the only place in this satellite image where we had thriving plants, like really booming from a productivity standpoint was up in this section that had a lot of beavers in it. And down here where there were not beavers, this is a riparian zone. It should have plants in it. It's not really that normal for your riparian zones to completely die every year. I know it down where I am in California, uh, in Southern California, we are having fire after fire burn through the river bottoms. And that is so unnatural for me to think about. I mean, I'm sure that river bottoms do occasionally burn in some settings, but like rivers are supposed to be wet. And even if they're not flowing above ground, rivers typically have a pretty strong groundwater flow beneath them. It is surprising to me to see rivers go so dry year after year that they can burn. And so I saw this, at least on this one part in Maggie Creek, but uh, it's fair to ask, okay, well, does this happen everywhere? This was in the middle of two droughts. This was both a seasonal and a multi-year drought, these images that I'm showing you. And it looks like the beaver dammed area is not really feeling this drought. Well, if you look at all the different sections in this study area, sections of creek with beaver versus sections of creek without beaver, beaver sections being shown in blue, non-beaver sections being shown in yellow, if you compare the ET to the NDVI signals, we get this nice linear relationship. And so what that's telling me is that throughout the study area, when I see ET going up, it is because we have more plants in that area and those plants are staying greener and staying productive for longer. If this was just open water evaporation or if this was soil evaporation or some other more uh, unfortunate water loss from the system, I would either expect to see a vertical line, so no real change in NDVI, no change in the plant greenness, but an increase in our evapotranspiration from a lot of open water. Or at least I would have thought, okay, well, if the beaver dammed areas are, they have a lot of open water, so that's kind of dominating their signal, then I would have expected this to be more of a hockey stick shaped curve where the slope in the beaver dammed area is much, much steeper from having more open water. But I didn't see that. 
I saw a nice clean linear relationship with both the areas without beavers and the areas with beavers, which shows that in this landscape, the observed ET that I was seeing was driven by plant productivity. This was not just open water evaporation. And it looked to me that year after year, these beaver dammed riparian zones were not feeling the drought effects. They were staying green. They were doing ET late into the summer when everything else in landscape had shut down. They didn't seem particularly sensitive to the droughts. The undammed riparian zones, on the other hand, definitely seemed a little more sensitive. So here we've got the months of the year, uh, April through October, shown on x-axis, and then on y, we've got evapotranspiration. Now again, blue indicates that the area had beavers, yellow indicates the area did not have beavers, and in this case, the dashed lines mean it's a drought, and the solid lines mean it's not a drought. So in the beaver dammed area, year after year, we've got a pretty nice arc of data, the plants are growing, they're getting lots of sun, and then fall comes and the sunlight goes away, so the ET starts to drop. Pretty classic arc, totally expected for well-watered vegetation. Now in the non-beaver area, it's a little different. In the beaver dammed area, all these lines looked kind of the same, but in the non-beaver area, the drought lines look very different from the non-drought lines. And so during the drought years in the area without beavers, the ET just monotonously decreases throughout the year. These plants never had a chance. As soon as you cut off the precipitation, as soon as you get out of the rainy, snowy season, that water flows away, it gets carried away by the Humboldt River, there's nothing left in the creeks, and the plants just have no choice but to shut down. They have all the sunlight they could possibly want to do evapotranspiration, to do their photosynthesis, but they don't have the water. Now, when we're back into the wet year, where it's not this multi-year drought, you can see the river was probably flowing a little bit healthier, and we have a bit more of an arc here. However, compare that to the beavers in the non-drought year, and it's still a depressed signal. There is an absolute difference that's fairly large between them, but again, in this beaver dammed area, it's a nice clean arc, arcing in about, with a peak in about July, whereas down in this undammed area, we get a little bit of a peak, and then it kind of drops off, then a rainfall event fluffs it up again, and then it drops off again. And so what this is showing me is that these beaver dammed areas, they don't know if it's a multi-year drought. They don't know if it's a summertime drought. They're just following the classic well-watered vegetation ET arc. They are totally oblivious to the drought conditions. But when you don't have those beavers and you're in this riparian zone in the arid west, what you're seeing is that it is really sensitive to if it's a drought year. Your riparian zone will shut down if it is not raining. And that is such a problem. Like these are habitats for creatures. Things live here. We need these riparian zones to maintain biodiversity. They serve a lot of ecosystem functions. And so having them just die off every time we have a multi-year drought is a real problem when you think about the fact that climate change might be making these multi-year droughts more frequent or more intense. So it appears to me from this data that beavers are irrigating the landscape. But you know, we also irrigate the landscape, right? We're humans. We are very, very smart. So how do we compare to the beavers? Or should I say, how do the beavers compare to us? So I've zoomed us out now. And we were looking at Maggie Creek, which is in this box over here. Uh, but there's also Susie Creek. And these two creeks are separated by some very sparsely vegetated hill slopes. So these hill slopes, totally precipitation dependent. These plants go green when they've got rain. They shut down when there's no rain. We are very familiar with this pattern here in California, where when we've got rain, the hillsides go green. And when there's not rain, they shut down and they go that kind of golden and then brown crunchy color. Now down here by Carlin, Nevada, we have an irrigated alfalfa field. Now humans plant alfalfa as densely as we can, and we water it as best as we can with all of our modern agricultural science to make that alfalfa be as productive as possible. And we're great at it. So what I wanna know is how are these beavers comparing? Do the beaver dammed areas look more like these hill slopes that are hydrologically disconnected from the river, from the groundwater, they're totally precipitation dependent? Or do they look more like the irrigated alfalfa that has an irrigation manager working to keep it green? And so what I saw was that the beavers are actually pretty good at managing plant irrigation in their riparian zones. So in gray, I'm showing you the PET, which is the potential evapotranspiration, a model for given the conditions that we had, what would be like the peak ET to expect from these crops. In green is the alfalfa. So these are humans irrigating alfalfa, doing everything we can with all of our science and tech to keep it green and healthy. In blue, again, is the beaver dammed riparian zones. And then in yellow is the riparian zones without beaver. And then in red are these hydrologically disconnected hill slopes. 
And so looking at a few things here. Now I want you to look at the shapes of these curves as well as the actual numbers and so how high they are up on this y-axis. So shape-wise, the beaver dammed area, the alfalfa, and the PET all look really similar. And they all look really similar regardless of if we're in a drought year or a normal year. The non-beaver dammed area, so the riparian zone that does not have beavers in it, looks really, really similar to these hill slopes that are hydrologically disconnected. They rely totally on precipitation. I don't think our riparian zones should be relying totally on precipitation. These are systems that are supposed to have at least some interaction with groundwater, but what it appears is that they do not, unless they have beavers, unless they have wetlands, unless they're returned to a more complex, wet, messy, healthy state. And so the take home messages on droughts and beavers is that we have higher overall ET when we've got beavers, those plants are more productive. They're not sensitive to long or short term droughts. Beavers don't know, the plants don't know, the wetland doesn't know. It's functioning just as it would any other year. And when you compare them to either hydrologically disconnected hill slopes or human managed irrig irrigated crops, the beaver dammed areas are much more similar to the irrigated crops. Now the stream without beavers, opposite is true. We've got lower overall ET, the plants are less productive. They are sensitive to both the long and short term droughts and they're acting hydrologically a lot more similar to these hill slopes that are precipitation dependent. And so that really is what got me thinking about beavers and fire, right? These sensitivities to droughts. Because before every single like massive fire season, the headlines I'm hearing is like, uh-oh, we're in a drought. Uh-oh, you know, we had a good wet winter, but now we're in a drought. And all that vegetation that grew super healthy and like those lush hill slopes, like that's fuel now. That's not a good thing. Like, I don't want that vegetation anymore. It's scary now. So I want you to think back to the conceptual model. So we've got these two streams without beavers, with beavers, and we're in drought conditions. We've got all this withered vegetation. It's senescing, it's shut down, it's crunchy, crinkly, dry, golden brown color vegetation. And that's not great. But where we have beavers, it's much greener and it's staying green. And we've shown that with all that satellite data that we just went through. What happens if there's one careless match? Or since it's California and we're being honest, what happens if there's a careless power line, right? That's not great. And that brings me to my conceptual model for beavers fighting fires. So we've got that careless match, that careless, careless power line, and it is landing in these landscapes. Now in one of these landscapes, we have an enormous amount of fuel that is ready to burn. And in the other landscape, we have an enormous amount of fuel theoretically. However, that fuel is wet. And you don't start a campfire with wet leaves. You start it with dry leaves because they burn easier. And fire is not necessarily something that has, you know, a, it's not evil. It, it doesn't have a moral value. It's not like violent or aggressive or trying to hurt the landscape. It is like at its very core, it is physics. And it is trying to burn what is easiest for it to burn. And if it's easy to burn dry vegetation, it's going to burn the dry vegetation. If it's easier to burn wet vegetation, it would do that. But it's not. It's not easier to burn wet vegetation. It takes a lot more energy. And so fire is going to preferentially burn the dry stuff. And when we have a lot of dry stuff, like we do in these landscapes without beaver, there's a lot of potential for burning there, especially if we had a lot of biomass before, especially if it was a good wet winter. And then we entered the summertime drought and suddenly things all dried out. What the beavers are doing is they're keeping things green throughout the year. They're never letting it turn into that really dry, crinkled state. They're making sure that the leaves are wet, the soil is wet, and water doesn't burn. Now, if you weren't convinced by that conceptual model, it's sad because I spent a lot of time in PowerPoint making those figures, but I have another conceptual model that I made that maybe will convince you. Now, it's only about 45 seconds long, but I, I do really think that this tells the story of my science uh, far better than I have ever done so in words.
5k, right? Yay, he made it. It's super important that he made it. But more importantly, the whole wetland ecosystem surrounding his pond made it through this fire. And I so wish that I could have just submitted this uh, stop motion to some journal and gotten it published. That would have been amazing. Uh, but that's, again, not quite how science works. So we needed to prove this. And this was already proved at least once. So Joe Wheaton, who is a professor at Utah State University, posted this photograph that he took uh, from Idaho, which burned during the Sharps fire, of a stream that has beavers on it. And so what he observed here is that there was an impressive patch of green in the middle of 65,000 acres of charcoal. So it turns out water doesn't burn, right? Ha, thanks beavers. They are more than just a low tech process based restoration tool. They are fire resilience. And so we've seen this happen at least once. Like this is, it is observed, which was great. Uh, it's always harder to start a project if it has never been observed before, but it has been observed. We've got my conceptual model. We've got this photograph. You can see these landscapes very plainly are burned heavily. And then this part of the riparian zone is bright green, got fire on either side, but these plants are doing okay. And what's in here is a bunch of beavers. There is a beaver dam that if you are somebody who spends hours and hours looking at beaver dams from aerial images, you immediately recognized. And if not, I'm pointing it out to you now. Uh, there's lots of beaver channels that they've dug out into the landscape. And if you're thinking, okay, well, it's the river, of course it didn't burn. Uh, I encourage you to just look downstream a little bit where there were no longer any beavers and where the fire had no problem burning through the river bottom. And so again, it's the beavers that have slowed the water, spread the water, stored the water, kept it in the soil, kept it in the plants, and kept these plants green and healthy and wet, leading up to this fire event that ultimately paid its dividends in making it so that this was unable to burn when the whole rest of the landscape was. So now I want to get into the science and the data collection that I actually did. So beavers fighting fire. Can we prove it? Can we prove that this happens in more than just one instance? I mean, it's totally possible that this had happened in Idaho and it was an amazing fluke of nature. And it was not a repeatable phenomenon. It was just this incredible thing that happened once. What I found, spoiler, is that that's not true. This happens across landscapes, across fires. And I'm not the first person to think about animals as agents in fire regimes. There's this great paper uh, that Claire Foster wrote and it summarizes that there's lots of things animals do that can affect how fire spreads in the landscape. I specifically am super interested in beavers, but they are not the only one. So if you're watching this talk and you're thinking, hmm, I wonder if this other animal could affect fire, you know, check out that paper as well. And I strongly encourage you to pursue that thought because there should be more uh, research and science on this topic. So it's me and I like my methods. I really like satellites. So I did really similar methods to the last study, uh, slightly tweaked it for this new question of do beavers fight fire instead of do beavers buffer drought? So step one, again, was finding all these beaver dams and finding them within wildfire perimeters. Now this was uh, an eye-opening moment for me, I would say, because I downloaded all the fire perimeters from the Western US and tried to open them all up and it just kept crashing my computer because the Western US burns so much. Uh, so I had to like limit it down to a couple year chunks at a time and I had to do it on my gaming PC instead of my laptop for work because it was just too many fires, uh, which was great for being able to design a study, but also very stressful to think about. So I'm finding all these fire perimeters and I'm looking inside these fire perimeters to find ones that had uh, active beavers and a lot of beavers so that I could really look at sections of stream both with and without beaver activity across the fire area, not just in one tiny creek. Then I used Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 satellites again. And this time I'm just looking at the NDVI of the riparian vegetation before, during, and after the wildfires. So before is the year before, during the same month that the wildfire happens, so like if a fire burned in July of 2000, then the before image is from July of 1999. During is from the month of the fire burning. And I did have to um, significantly parse down the number of fires I was looking at to deal with smoke obscuring some of my imagery. And then the after was the year following the fire in the same month again. So this would be like July of 2001. And then I used GIS and a whole bunch of statistics to classify my stretches of creeks as either being beaver impacted or not based on their proximity to beaver features such as dams, lodges, canals, uh, and clearing that they do when they chew trees. And then I compared these groups of beaver impacted and not beaver impacted sections of creek at multiple spatial scales across all these different fires, put it all together. And again, I'm looking at vegetation health in dammed versus undammed areas. And then this time it was in the fire scars of five different wildfires, one in California, one in Colorado, one in Idaho, one in Oregon, and one in Wyoming. 
So these are my study areas. What they had in common, they had big fires, they had a lot of beavers, and the imagery was high quality. So I was able to get nice, clear, cloud-free, smoke-free images, uh, both before and after the fire, as well as a decent one during the fire. At the time, I also thought these were huge fires. I now know that that is no longer the case. Uh, these fires were anywhere from 21,000 acres up to 395,000 acres. They are large fires still, even if there are things like mega fires and giga fires now that are much, much larger. But these were big fires, right? I wanted to look at large fires. I didn't want to look at little tiny brush fires. I'm reasonably confident that if you have a soggy piece of land, and regardless of why it's soggy, if it's slightly soggy, and you got a tiny little grass fire coming, like it's probably not going to burn. I'm interested in big fires, fires that clearly were able to get over creeks, get over rivers, get over topographic barriers, intense fires. And since we're in California, and I'm in California, and this fire was an interesting one to study, uh, I'm going to talk about the California Manter Fire as an example. So the California Manter Fire burned in Sequoia National Forest in a section of it called the Domeland Wilderness. It burned in the summer of 2000, and the perimeter was 90, sorry, 79,000 acres. So uh, that's a large burn area, and it is so full of beavers, and it has been so full of beavers for decades. Like I was looking at aerial images from the late 1990s, from the early 2000s, and it was full of beavers. And this is me up there just a year or so ago. It's still full of beavers. It's an incredible fire, and I have some really incredible photos from it that I'll be showing you shortly. But I wanted to point out, this is like my favorite beaver complex ever. It is just off the Pacific Crest Trail, so if you've gone backpacking, you've been probably quite close to it without knowing it. Here we've got a beaver lodge in the middle. This lodge is 60 feet across. Like, that is an apartment. These beavers have a house larger than like a lot of people I know in California. It's incredible. And this dam is like 300 feet long. And there are, I believe, 12 dams within this complex right here. So this is a heavily dammed landscape, and it has been this way for decades. And this is me walking. You can see there's lots of riparian vegetation around. This was in late October, so this was after uh, most of these willow had changed color and begun to drop their leaves. But you can see, just in the foreground up here, a nice huge beaver dam spanning channel to channel. So this is a great fire, and when I started this project, I was like, man, this fire is going to be so sweet, it's going to burn, it's going to be really intense. And I just wanted to bring it back into perspective. So I found this quote from the LA Times about this fire. It is a humbling expression of nature, walls of flame 70 feet high, twice as high as the nearest tree, leaping through canyons and valleys, at times in five directions at once, left behind, quite literally, is scorched earth. So this was clearly a huge fire, right? Beavers are big, they're up to 100 pounds, uh, they're not 70 feet tall. And beavers do a lot of work, they make these incredible wetlands, but this fire was scorching the earth. So I think this is a great point uh, to show you all because this is a really intense fire. And if the beavers could make it through this, that is really saying something about the way that they can modify the landscape. So in order to get the NDVI along these creeks, imagine that you're walking along each creek from a designated start point to a designated stop point. And then as you walk, stay as close to the river as possible and take note of how green the vegetation is as you go. So that's basically what I was doing with the remote sensing satellites, except instead of manually walking along the creek like 20 years ago, which was impossible, I was not there, uh, I was going back in time and pulling these pixels to see how green it was. Now, I'm going to show you just some sneak peeks of what the NDVI looked like as a raw image, um, knowing full well that this is very uh, not useful way to show this if I want to show a trend ultimately. But I do find it interesting to look at. So here we've got a section of the creek boxed and then I've drawn a dotted box around the section that has beavers. Before the fire, everything's looking all right. Blue means the plants are super lush. Yellow means they're alive. Red means they're not doing great. So before the fire, you can kind of see the creek running through here. It's a little bit brighter, got some big blue spots where the beavers are. And then during the fire, it just like it rips through. It burns through the river bottom here. And we've got, uh, it looks like some blue sticking around in the beaver dammed area, but not as blue as it used to be. And then after the fire, it all springs back because that's what riparian systems do. And that's great for the plants. You know, plants can come back to life, but what cannot come back to life are the fish and the frogs and the salamanders and nesting birds and little mammals and things that are living in this landscape, relying on this wetland ecosystem and not necessarily able to just spring back in the year afterwards. This happens on the other section of the river here. And again, in boxed, uh, in the dashed boxes, we have the areas that have beavers and everywhere else that does not have beavers. And here we even had some of the lushest wetland in the area that did not have beavers before the fire. 
And then unfortunately that area burned incredibly intensely during the wildfire. And then again, everything springs back afterwards, except for all the plants and, or sorry, except for all the animals and stuff that are not able to pull a Lazarus and come back to life after the fire. So making that a little more clear, here we've got distance along creek on X, and then NDVI is on Y. So the higher the value is here, the more green our plants are. I've shown this dashed line in yellow at 0.3, and that's the minimum that riparian vegetation should be if it's healthy and happy. The curves in green are before and after the fire, and then in this brownish color is during the fire. Marked in black boxes are the beaver dams. And you can see that before and after the fire, everything is kind of cruising along and it's fine, it's a little spiky, all good. But then during the fire, it's cruising along, a little spiky, all good, and then it plummets. And it never crosses that 0.3 threshold again. And that plummet point is right where we get out of the beaver dammed area. To make that more clear, I'm now just showing you the difference between these curves. We've got less affected by fire being a smaller number, more affected by fire being a greater number. And so again, when we're in this beaver dammed area, the difference is very small between the years before and after the fire versus during the fire. As soon as we're out of that beaver dammed area, it gets very large. So what this is showing me is that beavers and their dams are suppressing the effect of fire on plants. And this happened everywhere, right? This is not an isolated event, ha, but you cannot read these plots. They're so small. Um, so there's a much better way to visualize that than by just making these profiles for creek after creek after creek. What I did was I found the maximum difference on any given creek, and then I classified sections as either beaver impacted or not beaver impacted. If you divide the maximum difference at any pixel along the creek, or you divide the NDVI difference at any pixel along the creek by the maximum difference, you get the scaled NDVI difference. And so this is like in English, you think about how much did the vegetation actually burn at any pixel, and then scale it by how much it could have burned given the fire characteristics, given the fire that you actually had. And you can think about this scaled value as like a percentage of ma maximum burning that actually occurs in a given pixel. This is easier to conceptualize. Uh, you can think about it as like that percent of max burning instead of just like a scaled number. And it does let me generalize between these different fires. So different fire intensities, different land covers, et cetera. By finding that maximum value, that's a proxy for how much damage this fire could have done given its characteristics. And so I found that they're repeatedly creating refugia during fire. We've got a beaver dam up here. You can see the fire front. You can see the scorched earth. You can see these walls of flame twice as high as the nearest tree consuming the trees. And what I found with my data was that on average, these beaver dammed areas are uh, three times more buffered against the effects of fire than areas that do not have beavers. And that this was a statistically significant difference. And so here's that, that same landscape that I was showing you before, but from a different view, here's the beaver dam. You can see the burn all around it. You can see this sort of rock outcrop here. Here's another view of it. There's that rock outcrop again, there's the beaver dam. And then there's this little black blob that's hanging out on the creek bank. And I'm like, hmm, what is this? And the helicopter folks that took these photos uh, back in 2000 are like, hmm, what is this? And then you see it again, the helicopter's clearly very interested in this. I'm very interested in this. And it turns out there's a little black bear hanging out in this beaver pond. And so it clearly found this as a refuge right after that fire burned, it was able to find this beaver pond, find an intact habitat and be okay. So it looks like Smokey Bear got a little bit of a helping hand from Smokey the beaver in this case. So your take home messages on that, 19% NDVR reduction when you have beavers, 58% when you don't. Satellite and aerial images show greenery during fire in places with beavers, whereas they show burned vegetation during fire in places where we don't have beavers. This effect occurred across different climates, different land covers, different antecedent conditions. And this has a lot of potential when you think about preserving native species, keeping habitat intact for threatened species, and also potentially attenuating ash flows as they come through the system after the fire burns. And so just one final summary to put it all together for you. Beavers are creating and maintaining these super resilient landscapes. They're keeping plants green. This picture was taken after three months of drought and like a hundred degree day. And these plants were just loving it. They had so much water, they're so happy. And these places don't burn. And that's largely due to the way these beavers dig these channels, spread this water out and store it in the landscape. And if you weren't convinced 
by all this science that this is a worthwhile topic and something you should consider when you think about wildfires, perhaps you would be convinced by dollars. This study in Mammal Review found that beavers are doing a lot of ecosystem services for the landscape and that it is worth a lot of money. If you had one square kilometer of riparian zone with beavers, the beavers on that square kilometer of riparian zone are doing $69,000 worth of ecosystem services in a year. $12,500 of that was in extreme event moderation alone. So these ecosystem engineers, they're doing enough work that, that like, that's an engineer's salary right there, but they're doing it for free. Uh, they're really doing an incredible amount of work in the landscape for climate adaptation and mitigation in the face of increasingly intense wildfire. And so I am happy to take questions with the whopping four minutes I have left you uh, or in the Zoom afterwards. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emily. Um, I, For those of you who have not seen Emily before, I hope you are as impressed as I was the first time I saw her work. Um, it, and it, it is just so amazing to think about how much money we could be saving by investing in uh, beaver ecosystem restoration. <laughs> um, so we have a few questions here. And again, folks, if you have a question, uh, please put it in the Q&A and we'll transfer these over uh, in three minutes here to the uh, discussion if you're able to join us. Um, the first question is, uh, have you seen or worked on the Beaver Believers documentary? Uh, were you part of this, Emily? I was not part of the documentary, but I have seen it uh, many times. And I now actually do micro presentations when uh, they do film screenings to give people a little sneak okay. peek at my research on beavers. Okay. Uh, and then the other part of, of this question is, so broadly, uh, what do you know about policies and restoration plans for beavers? Um, and where in California are, is there a much a huge need for beaver reintroduction? Great questions. Um, beavers needed everywhere in California. We need them in the mountains. We need them on the coasts. Uh, there, there are more of them here than people would think. There's actually quite a few down in Southern California with me. They're all the way down into Northern Mexico. Um, they're all the way up to the Northern parts of the state. As I said, all the way to the coast, all the way in the mountain peaks. In terms of policy, it's super, super granular. And so it's like at the city level that decisions are being made about beaver management. So if you think your area could use beavers, I encourage you to start at this small scale level and just start asking like, what are we doing for fire prevention? And maybe could we encourage beaver restoration as part of that plan? Uh, and uh, Peter Brown very kindly uh, reminds us all that Caltech's mascot is the beaver. Uh, so uh, uh, obvious evidence that uh, there were once beavers across a much larger part of the state. Um, I, I, Will, I, I'm going to skip your question for just a second here because <laughs> you, you, you always ask very complex questions and I, I want to make sure we have time for Emily to answer it. Um, the uh, Let's see, one of the questions here uh, is, I work in the Sierra Nevada on meadows. Are there limits to stream sizes or types that are good candidates for using beavers as part of a restoration plan? That's a, an interesting question. I would say there are definitely ranges that beavers prefer. Uh, they love meadows and they're fine with streams that, they love streams that flow year round. They're fine with streams that have a little bit of an ephemeral nature to them, uh, but they have built in extreme environments. I mean, there are beavers in Victorville, like in the Mojave Desert that are living off like the grossest, tiniest stream flow. And there are beavers that are above 12,000 feet in Colorado that are living where they should not be. And so like, you could probably get them to live there if they had no other option if you started the restoration for them with a beaver dam analog. Okay, uh, that actually answers one of the, the later questions in the session uh, where someone asks, uh, what is the elevation and slope limitation on beaver activity? And, and of course, this is a Twitter discussion the other day where you noted that there were <laughs> beavers close to 12,000 feet in Colorado. How high have you seen them in the Sierra? Oh man. I, I know there's a ton of them up by Truckee and Tahoe. I haven't done quite as much exploring yet. I'm still newish to the state, uh, but I bet they're all the way up there. Like they never stop amazing. Why are they up so high? Because they don't want to hang out by us. That's why they're up so high. <laughs> 
<laughs> Understandable. Okay, we have hit four o'clock, so we are going to move over uh, to our discussion. Please join us. Uh, we can continue uh, picking Emily's brain about beavers and how we get more of them to help us wrangle with our fire problem. Please join me in thanking our fantastic speaker today uh, on beavers. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, it, again, the link for the discussion uh, is over in the chat box. Um, Emily does have a fantastic uh, YouTube of that stop motion that I also put the link to in there for those of you that want to watch that cool little thing again. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and so if everyone can please click over now to the uh, other webinar, we'll go ahead and get that started and be able to ask Emily some more questions. Thank you. Emily, that was so great. <laughs> Absolutely Thanks. love it. Um, and I, I was, when you brought up the Manter fire, the Manter fire was uh, literally one of the few fire, fires that I was on as a firefighter. So I have memories of that fire as a firefighter. So we'll have to talk about that sometime. Yeah, um, I got photographs from that fire, from the firefighters after I did a talk. And I was like, I wish I had uh, photographs of any of these fires. And then <laughs> um, this guy, Brad Higgins, he was like, yeah, I flew it. Here's some photos. I, I will tell you.